say one thing. I was not a spy, and I am not a spy now. I just write books. <laughs> and uh, I did have a lot of fun in Japan. Uh, we can talk about that at another meeting, perhaps uh, uh, something about Japan. But I want to talk about this book. Uh, it's uh, from Arcadia Publishing, and I, man, I have a lot of people to thank for this because this was so much work. Uh, I had to dig through more than a thousand photos over Cushing Library and a lot of photos in other places to come up th with this collection. And I recommend this collection, of course, because I, the author, but uh, for two reasons. One, this is a unique collection of photos. It's all in one book. Usually when you see a history of College Station, you see half the book about historical photos and then the other half from the sponsor. We're not trying to sell you anything here. This is a history series. It's just the Images of America series, which you're probably familiar with from Arcadia Publishing of North Carolina. So I recommend it um, because, well, I'd like to see people go over their history. I love history. I think it's important that we, we keep an eye on the past while looking at the future as well. We shouldn't forget our history. And uh, there is some rich history here in this area. I'm currently, uh, I see John Villas over there smiling. I'm, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, John is helping me research the history of Millikan. I'm hoping to do a book about that in the near future. So Millikan is a very interesting city for me as well. Welburn, Millikan. I'm sort of working my way up to Houston, Texas Central <laughs> Railway here, I guess. <laughs> But uh, College Station, uh, you, some of you might know the person in this picture. She was one of the original uh, campus kids. Uh, she, the campus kids, I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. Everybody knows this, right? No. No? No. no. Okay. Well, that makes me feel a little better anyway. <laughs> but the campus kids were on the campus, actually, of Texas A&M because that's where the campus of of the uh, uh, school was, the elementary school. And um, a lot of the kids who went all the way up through school actually went on the Texas A&M campus until it moved off after it became A&M Consolidated. Is that correct? Now, somebody raise their hand and, and tell me if I'm wrong. I'm not shy, so it won't hurt my feelings if you point out a mistake, which I'll probably make a few. This is me uh, back on well, back in the good old days, this is 1956. Uh, th this is when Texas A&M had a good football team. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they, they have a good football team now. I, that was rude, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Highway 6, uh, about one mile south of ne uh, Neely Store. Uh, if you know where Neely Store is in Welburn, that's where I lived and grew up. And a big old food baker. Yeah, that was my brother's, um, I think it was a 47 Studebaker, maybe 48. 51. Was it 51? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> okay. Okay, I guess you, you know, to start off talking about college station history, you have to talk about uh, the Carter family. And... Uh, I did put some uh, stuff in about the Carter family. Unfortunately, the publisher in their infinite wisdom decided to remove it. But we started at uh, Harvey Mitchell, and of course everybody knows who Harvey Mitchell was. Is there anybody in this room who doesn't know who Harvey, oh my goodness, oh my. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess you could call Harvey Mitchell the father of College Station or College of uh, Father of Brian. Is, is that Brazos pretty? County. Or father of Brazos, Brazos County, thank you. I'm getting it together here, bear with me. Uh, but yes, he was one of the original pioneers who came here, uh, here uh, a long time ago, way back in the 1820s, I believe it was. And uh, he was, you think I'm busy. Boy, this guy was really busy. He did almost everything. Uh, I think he was a uh, accountant for the Confederate Army here uh, from Brazos County. He was all of these things, and of course you know about Harvey Mitchell, uh, the two roads that are named after him. Uh, that's very confusing for me coming here, Harvey Mitchell Road, and then there's a Harvey Road, isn't there? Speaking of the CSA and the Confederate Army, uh, one of the lieutenant generals of the Confederate Army was a man named Lawrence Sullivan 
Ross, they call him Sully or Sol, usually Sol Ross. We have a statue of him over in front of the administration building on the campus. Uh, interesting story about that is that uh, the cadets used to wash this statue every Saturday. And uh, they washed the statue so, do you people know this story? They washed the statue so much that they were wearing down the copper on the guy's head. And the joke was that Saul Ross used to have a full head of hair. <laughs> In this photo he does because he was a young man. He has a very interesting career. He started out fighting Indians. Uh, he was uh, in a party which saved an American girl from an Indian tribe who had been kidnapped. He did a, a whole interesting history of this man, but he went on to become governor of this state, he, and he was the president of Texas A&M, who was very forward-looking and gave us those great traditions, the Texas A&M ring, the Texas A&M fight and Texas Aggie band, and the football team. All were visions of Saul Ross. And so probably he goes down in history of Texas A&M as the man who really saved Texas A&M from being closed. This was College Station in 1898. I liked this picture and I wanted to put it on the cover, but the publisher just couldn't fit it on the cover. The cover was the wrong size and the photo was about this big anyway. So. But it's interesting to me because of the elements in this photo. You'll notice that the children representing the uh, young city, uh, growing city, they have a bicycle, which is sort of symbolic of new technology at the time. And there's the station in the background. It sort of encapsulated all of that in one photo. I thought, wow, this is a great photo uh, for putting on the cover, but it just didn't work. Sorry about that. I tried. Uh, this is the college station you probably remember. Uh, if you were here in the 1950s, you probably remember this is the way it looked. You can see the sign college station on the extreme left right under the tree branches. Uh, you can't see it very well in this photo, but this is the way the original station looked. And as you know, on University Drive we have a replica, which is an art studio, but a replica of how the station really looked in those days. Like, there were many buildings that were built on the A&M campus to start off with. This was the first one. It was called Old Main. It was built in the year 1871. And like a lot of buildings on the A&M campus, it wasn't built too well. As a matter of fact, two years after it was built, they found flaws in the structure, had to rebuild it, and it opened in 1875, just in time for students to come in the next year, 1876. A&M started off with 40 students and six administrators. The Old Main met its demise in 1912, not too long after that, and it burned to the ground and was not rebuilt. So the thing about Old Main was it didn't feature any places for students to live. The Gathright Hall was named after the uh, first president of Texas A&M. Actually, uh, his name was Thomas F. Gathright, and he was a friend of Jefferson Davis, the president of the old Confederate States of America. Actually, Jefferson Davis was asked to be the president of Texas A&M. He refused for health reasons, and he said, I have a friend here in Mississippi, and that was Thomas S. Gathright, and he came over and became the first president. Texas A&M, that hall is named after him, and the reason it's important, it was the second building on the campus, and it had housing for the students who badly needed it. There was also a problem that there was no rooms available for visiting professors and people who were visiting A&M, important people. So they built a hotel called the Shirley Hotel. It was built in 1906 and was closed in 1929. Notice the year 1929 was the crash of the stock market. Uh, a lot of people lost their fortunes and the effect on Texas A&M, of course, was a reduction of students reduced students, they didn't need the hotel anymore, they tore it down, along with several other buildings. The president's house was actually built for Saul Ross back in 1893 for, as a place for him to live. Notice the oxen cart there, and it looked kind of pretty rough in those days. Uh, he even had longhorns pulling <laughs> the wagon. Don't tell that to two you. This is one of my favorite buildings. Notice the East European architecture of this building. It's very interesting because if you go to East Europe, you'll see some, Eastern Europe, you'll see some of this kind of architecture. 
And the reason is because when the original buildings were built, they were designed by Eastern European architects. This is one example. And a lot of these buildings uh, were characteristic of the early Texas A&M campus. And, and you might ask me, are you talking about College Station or are you talking about Texas A&M? Well, really, at this stage, there wasn't any difference. Texas A&M was College Station, <laughs> although the railroad track, as Jim Boone aptly pointed out, was called College. This is how the A&M campus looked in the year 1900. You will probably recognize some of the buildings there. This is a sort of a panoramic view, but notice in the front you have what looked like to be a telephone or a telegraph wire. This is the A&M band, which was formed way back in, in the 19th century, and you see them marching along the old military walk there in 1903. A pretty big band already at that point. How many people remember Guyon Hall? Oh yeah. yeah. Guyon Hall was very interesting for this area because it was many things. It was where all the performances occurred. Uh, Ann even remembers going to movie, matinee movies there. This is a wonderful old building. Uh, it was at one end of uh, Military Hall and Sabisa Hall was at the other. Uh, I don't have a picture of Sabisa Hall, but there's one in the book. Uh, and uh, Mr. Sabisa, who was very prominent in Texas A&M history. As I mentioned, there weren't very many housing areas for students back in the 19th century and early 20th century. And so guess what? The Aggies lived in tents. They called it Tent City, and it was probably pretty cold when a norther came in. As you, as you notice, it's pretty open here. It's okay for the summer months, but um, I would hate to have been there in January and February. We also had a problem with Bryant. Now, it's interesting, the story goes, and I, I can't confirm as some of the historians might be able to, that this university was built in the middle of a dewberry patch. When the first stake was pounded down into the ground to mark the area, it was, they had to pull the uh, dewberry, patch, uh, dewberry vines away and drive in the stake. But it was because they had to maintain a distance from Bryan, which had a notorious reputation. <laughs> there was a saloon, and every other building was a saloon, and they didn't want their pristine Aggies going down there and doing things they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> so they built it away. Well, this presented a problem. Some people actually lived in Bryan. So how do you get from Bryan to College, college Station uh, or to the Texas A&M campus? They built a trolley. And this was the, what was called, uh, sort of jokingly called the Toonville Trolley, but it was a operating railway called the Bryan College uh, Railway, which operated for, between these years, 1910 and 1922. Originally, it was driven by gasoline, and, ag and when it went up the hill over there, the Aggies had to get out and back and push. Yeah, some people were laughing, they remember that. So, uh, Later, it was converted to electricity and um, worked a little bit better, but still, there wasn't enough people to keep it going. It closed in 1922. You can't talk about Texas A&M history and College Station without talking about football. And this, as I mentioned, is something Saul Ross gave us. Thank you very much, Saul. And uh, the first team was formed in 1892. This is the uh, game with LSU in eight, 1899, in which we won that one. Um, <laughs> the Cotton Bowl this year wasn't too good, but uh, at least we have that in history. We won that one pretty well. However, in those days it was interesting because Texas A&M started off not playing college teams, they started off playing high school teams. And one of the, I think as uh, Henry Dethelow pointed out, one of the first games they played was against Galveston Ball in the Galveston High School. This is what the 1910 uniform looked like. This is a, uh, a kind of a homely kind of uniform, and if you look in the background, the bleachers held what, about 10 people maybe, 15 people? <laughs> so it was uh, a little different in those days. Notice the padding, uh, almost no helmet. It looks more like a hat than a helmet. Uh, back in the 20, 1920s and 1930s, they got a little bit more sophisticated with the leather helmet. We'll show that in a minute. Uh, this is one of the great players of Texas A&M history. One really interesting, 1939. This is the 1939 team. He was number 39. 
His name was John Kimbrough. They called him Jarn. John Kimbrough was the fullback for that great team that's the only time that the Texas A&M Aggies won a national championship. They went to the Sugar Bowl and beat Tulane University 14 to 13. John scored both touchdowns. This was uh, a picture of John, a promo picture of him. He was called the Haskell Hurricane, where he came from because he came from Haskell, Texas. Now, you've all heard the story that Texas A&M beat TU, Texas University, as we call it, the T-Surpers, in 1915. The 1915 game, Texas A&M won 13 to zero. And guess what they did? Like good Texas Aggies, they went over and stole the mascot of Texas University, a Longhorn, and branded 13 to zero on the side. This is the branding team just before they grabbed the animal. And that's the animal. That's how Bevo got his name. The Texas uh, Longhorns were in a quandary. They changed the 13 to zero into a B-E-V-O, and that's how Bevo got his name. A&M has always had a sense of humor, and it's kind of hard to understand unless you live here. And like they say, it's kind of, you know, if you live here, it's kind of hard to explain to outsiders, and, and an outsider can't understand it anyway, so just. A&M <laughs> humor, this is uh, after they beat Baylor. <laughs> this, uh, interestingly enough, these, these next two photos were found in the Carnegie Library in a shoebox back in a shelf just recently. And uh, they are of the a and football team back in the 1920s and 1930s. This is uh, taken from the sidelines there. Notice the referees uh, and the helmets, or those old hel uh, leather helmets I was talking about. This is the fight in Texas Aggie Band at, the, at that same game. Uh, I believe it was in the 1920s. Which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because notice on the top of the horseshoe there, you have the press booth. When was the press booth put on there? Was it the late 20s? Somebody tell me. No? But they did add a press booth uh, that wasn't there when it first opened in 1927. This is how Kyle Field looked, the old horseshoe. This is a bird's eye view of the, of the uh, uh, field. And notice uh, over here is the, where the trains were parked. And the reason the trains were parked there during the game is because there were no hotels available. People stayed overnight in the train. So they could walk right across there and uh, go to the game and then go back to their uh, berth in the train. So that was how they did it in those days. There just wasn't any hotels available. This is Reveille 1. And this, does everybody, how many people know the story of how Reveille got his name, got her name, sorry? Everybody knows that? Well, the story goes, in the 1930s, I think it was 1933 or 34, the, uh, uh, some Aggies coming back from a trip, probably a drinking trip, to Navasota, coming <laughs> back to the campus, and they saw this dog along the way, and they picked the dog up and put, him in, put her in the Model T and brought her back to the campus. Now, the next morning, the dog got up with the Aggies, and when somebody played Reveille on the bugle, the dog barked in tune with the, with the bugle. That's how she got her name as Reveille. This is Reveille 1. We're up to what, Reveille 8 now? Or? Okay, so another interesting story about the Reveilles is that there are uh, uh, several of them are buried at the north gate of Kyle Field, buried with their paws looking into the stadium so that they always see the Aggies winning on the scoreboard. This is uh, the famous Bear Bryant uh, who coached the team in 19. Uh, 55, 56, and uh, you know the story about Bear Bryant hearing his mama calling. He went back to Alabama in, the, in a very important game in which the Aggies were about to win a national championship. They were playing Rice. At halftime, he announced to the team and he had heard mama calling. He's going back to Alabama, and A&M lost the next three games and the national championship. This is that team that I'm talking about, 1956, 1957. Almost made it. And of course, this is the man who still works here on the Texas A&M campus, is the only football player from Texas A&M who ever won the Heisman Trophy, John David Crook. Now, you can't talk about A&M or College Station history without talking about Earl Rudder, because you come down the Earl Rudder Freeway if you're coming here. Earl Rudder was a World War II hero. This is him at Normandy. 
he and his group knocked out the 150 millimeter batteries at the top of uh, Omaha Beach, uh, saving hundreds, probably thousands of lives because the Germans were dropping shells on the people landing on the beach. Another Aggie hero, this is 1942, uh, who was traveling with Doolittle in his famous flight over Tokyo. They crashed in China and uh, Let's see, I can't remember the Aggie's name right now. Somebody will tell me, I'm John sure. Hilger. Right, John Hilger. That's him right there with his arm in arm with the Chinese guy. That's uh, Doolittle next to him. So they, they were picked up. They became heroes because they bombed the Japanese before anybody else. This is the famous muster at uh, Corregidor. This was April 21st, 1942. And, uh, Excuse me, 1946. Yeah. Oh, this picture was after the war? Yes, sir. Oh, they I'm sorry. Out when they were the in I, have, I have been corrected. Okay. But uh, I wanted to bring up the muster. Does everybody know why the Aggies muster on April 21st? No? Okay. That's because San Jacinto was won. Texas Independence was won on April 21st. So the Aggies every year muster on. April 21st, wherever they are, they mustered all over the world. Uh, in 1945, for example, when the war was over, they mustered in Germany and Japan and Hawaii and all over the place. This is supposed to be the picture of the muster at Corregidor. And of course, the Japanese took the island called the Rock uh, about two weeks later on May the 6th of 1942. And most of the Aggies in the muster were killed. This is when the Aggies moved into Tokyo in August 1945 when the war was over. And of course, the Aggies always show their colors. And uh, notice a couple of things. That's the Texas flag right there. And this is We've Never Been Licked, which is the name of a movie made about Texas A&M during the war. Has everybody seen you never been, We've Never Been Licked? Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> You would be amiss probably for not uh, mentioning the people who received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, there was only one that came back alive and received it from uh, President Truman. This is a picture of him. This is uh, Mr. Whiteley receiving the Medal of Honor. But really, here, here's an interesting point, and maybe not everybody realizes that the reason college, one of the re main reasons that College Station grew into a city is because there was an edict passed on the Texas A&M campus that the professors and their staff must move off campus. The houses were moved off campus, as you see in this picture, and therefore these residential areas started popping up around the campus. And this was really the beginning of uh, College Station. And this was the early 1930s. And uh, by 1938, it was pretty clear what they had to do. They had to incorporate and become a city. This was, uh, what was the second mayor? Second. He was the second mayor. His name was Langford. He was a professor at a and He was a very brilliant man. He was into archi archiving uh, historical materials. He was an architect. He was a, a scholar. And he became mayor. And he was mayor for 24 years during the period that College Station really developed into a modern city thanks to the leadership of Dr. Langford. Now, when uh, the Langford reforms went through and people started seeing that there are opportunities here in uh, College Station. Easterwood Airport was there and it was named after Jesse Easterwood who died in World War I. And entrepreneurs like Guy Davis pictured here opened up an airline, the Davis Airlines. Did anybody ever fly on Davis Airline? Oh yeah. <laughs> Also, A&M is known as a place where people come from all over the world to study. This is one reason. This is a firefighting school out near the airport. It's called Brayton Fire School. People come here to learn the most modern firefighting techniques. Now, as A&M grew, so did the social life here in College Station. Uh, this is a person somebody might know in here, Nancy Reynolds. This is before she was married. Her, her last name was Tyner, was it? Yeah, that's Audie Murphy from World War II. And uh, of course, you know Audie Murphy. He was from Texas as well. He wanted to be an Aggie. He was signing up to become an Aggie when he was drafted by the Army. Uh, uh, not drafted, when he joined the Army. Uh, and uh, he never did make it to A&M as a student, although he did visit for, uh, as a visitor on the campus. And he was 
Of course, the red carpet was rolled out for him because he was the most decorated soldier of World War II. Now, and when the college station was growing and when the campus was growing, uh, it was still a military campus in the 1950s, and there were, what, about uh, 6,000 students or uh, something like that. But it, it, was not, it was not open to uh, most minorities and to women and to other people. So, but it was growing as a city. And when you have people coming in to go to college so on the GI Bill, which a lot of them came back from World War II on and started to school at Texas A&M, you had to provide them with food. This was a grocery store there at uh, first at Eastgate and then at Northgate. And an interesting story that Ann told me that a little boy in the Church of Christ was asked in the 1950s to name the four Gospels, and he said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Charlie. <laughs> because the name of the store was Luke and Charlie's. So the reforms pushed through by Earl Rudder, the same hero at Normandy who became president of Texas A&M, really changed the university forever. And in 1963, the doors were flown open to uh, women. Uh, but actually women, you, you explained to me that women actually did go to A&M uh, in limited cases before that. And Hispanics were uh, uh, students ever since the 1870s. So it is a misnomer to say that A&M was completely closed to minorities and women, but the doors were flown open in 1963 and then the flood came in and we see A&M quickly grow from a small military college into a major university. Uh, one of the I guess, iconic people uh, that really symbolized the women's uh, growing power at Texas A&M was Kimberly Tomes, who was named Miss USA in 1977. And when she received the prize on stage, she almost fainted, saying, I'm the first Aggie to become Miss USA. <laughs> The Memorial Student Center, when it was open, was visited uh, President, I, was he president then, or was he just Eisenhower? He was president of Cornell. Uh, Cornell, thank you. Um, Columbia. Columbia. Columbia, okay. So Eisenhower visited. Um, this is one of the a and presidents on the right, and his name slips my mind at the moment. Who can help me? It looks like Tom Harrington. Harrington. Harrington, yes, it was. Thank you very much. Of course, you can't, you can't ever talk about Texas A&M without mentioning this Kyle Field, the hallowed ground where the Aggies have played football since 1927. But this is an interesting picture because it's the Bush, uh, President Bush's special train uh, that going in front of the stadium. This is when they opened the George Bush Memorial Library. And uh, I think this was the ceremony outside, wasn't it? Uh, taken from the right-hand side. Also, A&M is, is kind of an interesting, fun place to live because we have such interesting events. And one of them is uh, World War II rec battle recreations, and that will be coming up soon, right? In what? Second weekend of spring break. And this man, Denny Hare, is a impersonator. One of the uh, men who impersonates you know who. And, uh, Interestingly enough, Denny's so good at this that he has actually been appointed the official patent uh, impersonator by the European Union. Yeah. Is that correct? <laughs> now, here's... Uh, it's <laughs> another interesting story about this area, College Station. Of course, you know the strip over there in Northgate where all the Aggies go get drunk repeatedly. And... Uh, <laughs> One of the, their watering holes is the Dick, Dixie Chicken, and that's pretty, you know, it has the, does it still have the snake and the dominoes and everything? I don't know, I haven't been in there, but the story goes that this is the inspiration for the Dixie Chicks. This is where they took their name. We also had some famous people living here. Uh, how many people remember this, this couple? Okay, so Manning and uh, Nita Smith were square dancers par excellence. They were known all over the world. They went around the world with teaching uh, square dancing techniques. They were called the <laughs> Neiman Marcus of the round world. And uh, Nita designed costumes for square dancing for men and women. And Manning was 
one of the coaches of the Texas A&M baseball team. Finally, I would like to point out that Aggies, you know, there's nothing like an Aggie, is there? <laughs> they know how to relax, and uh, it's hot in Texas. Everybody knows it's hot in August, and this is one way of doing it. They found a way to relax. And I'm going to relax for a couple of questions uh, if anybody wants to make a comment. Or